तस्मै श्री गुरुवे नमः नमः विष्णु पदाय कृष्ण विष्णाय भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नाम नमस्ते सरस्वती देवी गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेषा शून्यवादे आशाकदेशतायिने maintain our enthusiasm amid discouraging situations so one of the things is that life often disappoints or even devastates us and at such times so we are going on a particular path so we using this as a white board to write and draw certain things we are going on a particular path and inevitably we face obstacles now some obstacles can be overcome some obstacles seem almost impossible to overcome they are like huge so at such times it is natural that our enthusiasm starts going down so especially when we have an understanding that god exists that god is in control and then when we are trying to do something we are often trying to do something good and still we are facing obstacles so how do we move forward in such a situation so the gist of the class i'll be emphasize in two broad statements enthusiasm if you want to maintain it the two parts to it hold on to our plans lightly and hold on to our purpose tightly so there is there are plans and there is purpose so broadly we could say if i am here my purpose is to go here so now i could go here this way i could go here this way i could go here this way so which way i go those are my plans so hold on to our plans lightly because our plans sometimes work and sometimes don't work now at the same time when we are holding on to our plans lightly we should not be holding on lightly to our purposes then we will not move forward okay this is not working let's forget it <coughs> so let's try to understand this in terms of another visual so if we hold on to our plans tightly then what happens is <coughs> what do you think happens the plan doesn't succeed and we then we get frustrated and angry then we get frustrated and then we might just become angry we might become resentful this car might become hateful we might become too discouraged yes why is this not working Uh, generally so when we get angry so we if we might hold on to a plan very tightly and if somebody else is not holding on to their plan tightly 
no, we are disturbed because of the plan because the plan is not working, and the other person is not so disturbed, and we are disturbed because the other person is not disturbed. <laughs> 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 they say they are saying why are you taking this so seriously, and we are saying why are you not taking this so seriously. <laughs> so on one side, if we hold on to the plan too tightly, then we just, if this doesn't work, that means nothing will work. We become like that. In one sense, we become resentful and our vision becomes very narrow. If this doesn't work, nothing is going to work. On the other hand, if we hold on to our purpose lightly, then what do you think will happen? Change we just keep on changing. Yes, as I say, a rolling stone yeah. gathers no moss. Yes. So we will just become basically ineffectual. We'll never be able to do anything. We'll become un uncommitted and just distracted by anything and everything. So <clears throat> it's. Uh, to be committed, we need to have a strong sense of purpose. So we could say in one sense, if you are coming for this program today. So your purpose is to come for the program. The plan is, okay, I'll go by this road. But if this road is blocked, then we can go by another road. We can go by another road. So in general, if we don't have a strong purpose, then again our enthusiasm is weak. Like from the beginning only enthusiasm is weak. But if we have strong attachment to a plan, then also what happens? The enthusiasm becomes weak when the plan doesn't work. So the key, so in both cases, the enthu, here it goes down, and here the enthu is down already, down from the start itself. So if we want the enthusiasm to be maintained, we need to have this balance that the plans lightly and the purpose tightly. So when we have this, then we can be, three, four things happen by this. First thing, we can be resourceful. Rather than being resentful, okay, this is not working, let me try this, let me try this. We can be resourceful. And not only resourceful, we can have a broad vision. Okay, okay, is it, okay, it's not working, but yeah, I have to go there. This road is not, this road is blocked, the traffic situation is not good. Maybe I can go from other way. So just the openness to look at options is there. And that's how the enthusiasm can be sustained. So hold on to our plans. Lightly, not tightly. Now, <clears throat> let's look at some situations where this works out or how this is demonstrated. In general, the Mahabharata explains that when we are doing a particular thing, how do we know whether it is right or wrong? Every book has a driving purpose. So for example, <coughs> the Srimad Bhagavatam has a driving question. Does anyone know what is its question? Yes, what is good for people in general all the time and especially at the time of death. The time of death. Parishit Maha is about to die. So what is the duty of a person about to die? That is the driving question of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Now, in one sense, the Bhagavatam largely begins where the Mahabharata ends. And the Mahabharata has a driving question also. So, that is Dharma. So, the Bhagavatam's driving question is basically Antakala Dharma. When somebody is about to die, what is the right thing for them to do? When we use the word duty, it's a 
it's an approximate translation for dharma. Duty means you have to do it. It's, it's your duty, you must do it. But dharma uh, has more a sense of not so much obligation that you have to do it. That part is there. This is your dharma. But more in a sense of meaning. That means this is the thing that will add value to your life. When you are about to die, what is the most valuable thing you can do? While you are living, what is the most valuable thing you can do? So the entire Mahabharata at one level is a search to understand what is Dharma. And in its overall analysis, it says that whenever we are trying to decide whether an action is right or wrong, we look at three broad factors. The first is the content of the action. What am I doing? And before that comes the intent of the action. Why am I doing it? And then after that comes the consequence, the result of the action. And based on these three factors, we decide what is the right thing to do and what is the wrong thing to do. Now there are some people who consider that only the content alone matters. That what you are doing alone determines what is right and what is wrong. So, speaking the truth is good. Speaking lies is bad. And that's all there is to it. The content of the action is all that matters. So this idea is called as categorical ethics. That this is the category of right and this is the category of wrong. And that's all there is. One category here, one category here. So truth and lies. For example. Now to some extent categorical ethics is important. There are right and wrong actions. But at the same time, real life is complex. Now, suppose there is a riot going on and say the members of a particular community are being targeted. And one of our friends is from that community. And that friend comes and knocks at her door, oh, please, please, save me. And we take that friend and hide that friend in the basement, somewhere deep in our house. And those, those rioters come and knock on the door. Is he here? Now what should we do at that time? Now, yeah. Now we can say I'll speak the truth, and I, the right thing is to speak the truth. But we, we cannot evaluate right or wrong solely based on content. We have to look at the content, but we also look at the broader picture. So here, the right the speaking the truth will lead to a terrible result that a person will be killed. And that is a far worse result. So as contrasted to categorical ethics, there is another kind of ethics called as contextual ethics. Context means we look at where a particular action is done. So in contextual ethics, we look at two things. The intent and the consequence. So what is the result of doing something? And why was something done? So for example now, when Durvasamuni came to the house of Duryodhan, <coughs> and when he came there, at that time, he, he said to, he served Durvasamuni very nicely. And he said that, oh, you know, you are such a great sage. You have blessed me by coming here. I would like that my cousins also be blessed. <laughs> so, please, you visit them also. And you know, generally in the morning, they are quite busy with their dharma kriya. So you can visit them at noon. So that they can serve you conveniently. So now here, at one level, uh, sage has come to our house and we are telling the sage to go to our relative's house. 
from the content point of view, it's a nice action. But was it a good action? No. His intent was wrong. His intent was now. Of course, in that case, what happened? The consequence was he hoped for a particular consequence. They will not be able to serve him. We all know the Kaurav was in the forest. They didn't have. They had. They, they were not wealthy. They were not having royal opulence. So they had a akshay patra with which they could provide food. But after Draupadi ate, that akshay patra would be exhausted for the day. So if they went in the afternoon, then they would have nothing. So that was Duryodhan's plan. So sometimes an action may seem good from the content perspective, but Then somebody, I suppose somebody is very normally known to be very rough and rude, and that person is suddenly nice with you, so I like that with polite, and then we naturally become suspicious. Then we say that, then we say, I'm being so nice to you. Why are you being suspicious? Which is because you are being nice. I'm suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> so the the content to be nice is good. But in context, if I look at the past, the way the person has been, okay, why are you being nice now? So the intent also matters. So intent, content, and consequence—all three need to be considered, and based on that, a decision is to be made. What is to be done? What is not to be done? And so now, why am I talking about this? In terms of plans, so when we make a plan. How do we know whether the plan is good or not? There is no way in advance to know. Okay, we could say my intent is good. Mm -hmm. uh, the content, well, it's reasonably well thought out. It's logical. But what will be the result of that? Many times we can't foresee it. Sometimes some things we can foresee, but none of us can. For sure, tell what is going to happen in the future. So, <clears throat> we'll talk about through the Kurukshetra War two examples of this intent, content, consequence framework we applied. Then I'll talk a little later about how Shri Prabhupada applied it. And then finally, we'll conclude by what it means for all of us. So, <clears throat> when the Kurukshetra War was being fought. How many days was the war? Do you remember? Eighteen days. Eighteen days. And on the tenth day, something significant happened. Bishma. Yes, Bishma fell. So Bishma was the Pandava commander for Pandava commander. Pandava commander. So, did I make a mistake intentionally? Yes. Or. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the intent of your statement. <laughs> okay. So, so first Vishnu was the commander, and after that, who became the commander? Any idea? He was the commander for how long? Fifteenth. Yeah, for five days till the fifteenth day. Now, when Drona became the commander. Hey, Duryodhan was quite manipulative. Duryodhan very much wanted Karna to be the commander, but Karna also recognized that Drona is the guru of most of the warriors over here, and in his presence, if I am made the commander, everybody will feel that Drona has been snubbed, and they will not listen to me. Therefore, he said that let Drona be the commander. Now, Drona knew how. Attached or how close was the friendship between Bishma and Karna? So he also expected that Karna would become the commander, and he was not very happy about the idea of serving under Karna. When he was offered the post of the commander by Duryodhan, he was pleasantly surprised. He says, "Thank you for this honor, Duryodhan." He says, "I am pleased with you." And I would like to give you a boon. What do you want? Now, Duryodhan was just ready for this. So he said that I desire that you arrest Yudhishthir alive 
and bring him as a prisoner before me. Drona, his face smiled. He said that. So you this is such an ajahat chatru that you don't that even you don't want him killed. So Duryodhan said, actually, on seeing these ten days of the war, how Arjuna and Bhima have fought, how Bhishma has fallen, I have concluded it that we will not be able to win this war. Then, if it's already concluded that, then why not stop fighting? <laughs> Therefore, I have decided that if you can arrest Vishnu and bring before me, then I will challenge you to another gambling match. And I will have him exiled again. And during those 13 years, I will prepare a bigger army and then we will win. So, I thought, you will never learn. <laughs> now, Druna said that I can arrest Yudhishthir, but on one condition. You have to keep Arjuna out of the way. Although Arjuna is my student, but he has learned almost everything that I know. And he is younger than me. And he has also acquired celestial weapons by austerities. Therefore, if he comes in the way, I won't succeed. So Duryodhan said, okay, we will deal with it. So there's a king named Susharman, the Trigata, Tigaratas. He said, I will challenge Arjuna and sidetrack. So on the 11th and 12th days, at the start of the war itself, Susharman, with his army, would charge towards Arjuna and challenge him. And he would draw Arjuna away. On both days, Drona came very close to arresting Yudhishthira. But in the nick of time, Krishna told Arjuna that you need to go back right now. Yudhishthira is in trouble. And Arjuna charged back. And on the 12th day, especially, Yudhishthira had been in an extremely helpless situation. His chariot had been killed, his horses had been killed, his armor had been destroyed, his arms had been pierced. So he was defenseless, chariotless, and basically helpless. And Yudhishthira would have been arrested, but Arjuna came in the nick of time. And while Arjuna saving, Yudhishthira was heroic. Drona not being able to arrest Yudhishthir was shambolic. It's like you know it's like the match is there to be won. Now the cricket World Cup is coming. And now the cricket fever is there. It's there in India. Is it here also? Little bit. Okay. So I don't want to increase it. <laughs> but anyway, suppose you just have one over to bowl. And the opposing team needs like 36 runs to play. And it's a batsman comes and hits six sixes. <laughs> you know, it's heroic for the batsman, but it is devastating for the bowler. So it's like the prey is right in front. And you is about to be arrested in Arjuna King. So that night, Duryodhan just couldn't contain his anger. And he said, no. Oh Acharya, I fear that because of your affection for the Pandavas, you are not fighting for that. That is why, despite I having kept my part, you have not arrested Yudhishthira. If your heart is not in the fight, kindly step down from the post of the commander 
let Karana become the commander. And he has promised to provide me with victory. Now this was extremely insulting for the world. Oh child. He says, it is in fighting for your sake that my body is covered with wounds right now. I have exerted to the fullest of my capacity. What more do you think can Karana do? Endeavor alone is in our hands. It is destiny which determines the results. And O Duryodhan, the Lord of Destiny is on the side of Archana. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, Drona was trying to raise the discussion to a higher philosophical level. But, Duryodhan was not interested. He said, no. If you just want to give excuses for not winning, not fighting and not winning, then, is not satisfactory. So Drona said, okay, tomorrow I will form our army in such a family, in such a formation that it will be impossible for the Pandavas to defend. Which was that formation? Chakra Viva. Now, he says, if you can keep Arjuna aside, then we will arrest Yudhishthir tomorrow. Or at least, we will trap one of their chief warriors who tries to save Yudhishthir. So now, the way they started, they didn't form the Chakravyu right at the start of the 13th day. It's a normal military formation. But everybody had been told, at least the key, key leaders had been told, and there was always espionage, the spies would be there. But none of the spies from the Pandava side who were in Kaurava's camp could come to know about this. Because this was kept among the top people only. And then Arjuna was again challenged by Susharman. If Arjuna had seen the chakra view, he would not have accepted the challenge. But Susharman diverted Arjuna. And as soon as Arjuna was diverted, then immediately the military was reformed. And the chakra view just started marching forward. It was impenetrable. And at that time, the Pandavas had a decision to make. At that time, Bhima and Yudhishthir met. Yudhishthir was the officially commander of the army, but he was relatively junior. And he had been made commander for multiple reasons. One of the reasons was that Arjuna while he, he was by far the best warrior and Bhima was also a great base fighter, uh, they wanted that the talents of Arjuna and Bhima be used more for fighting than for organizing. Like in cricket sometimes, uh, the best batsman might be made a captain. But then, when they become the captain, the, the pressure of captaincy that affects their batting performance. Then you say, okay, you just be a batsman, you just bat well, and somebody else can be the captain. So it was like that. Dushudhana was relatively junior, but then the big decision had to be made because he was not so experienced. Dushudhana was also there, but Bhima and Yudhishthira discussed. And when they discussed, okay, don't worry, I think here the screen is gone. Reminding me, I should keep writing something. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, at this particular point, Bhima and Arjuna, dis uh, not Arjuna, Bhima and Yudhishthira discussed. And Bhima told Yudhishthira, I am the only person in our side who can break the chakra view. Yes, who? Yudhishthira said, call Abhimanyu. And when Abhimanyu came, and Yudhishthira told him, O oh son, today a great task befalls you. This chakra will destroy our entire army. Please break it through and save our army. Abhimanyu was a little hesitant. He said, I will do whatever you say, but 
I need to tell you. I can break into it. But I don't know how to break out of it. So Bhima said, Bhima is the exchange of glasses. Bhima said, yes, we know about it, but don't worry. Once you go in, we will follow you inside. And once we are inside, we will destroy together. Destroy the chakra view from inside. Thought, That's a good plan. And then they went inside. They started going inside. And Abhimanyu, with his expert, he just broke that impenetrable scene formation. And he charged inside. And the Pandavas following close on his heels. But then something unexpected happened. What was that? So Jayadrath came in. So basically, if you consider the chakra view to be like this, then Abhimanyu went in. But after Abhimanyu had gone in, the chakra view had been broken to some extent. But while it was broken, So while it was broken and the Pandavas were just about to enter, okay. <laughs> circle is not staying unbroken. Huh? Okay, let us see. So it is broken, so suddenly Jayadrath came over. Now Jayadrath was not a very formidable warrior. He was a warrior, but not a formidable warrior. In fact, in most analysis, if you consider the army's primary forces that are described in the Bhagavad Gita start, who are the Pandava side, who are the Kaurava side, who are the conscious. In both the cases, Jayadrath is not directly mentioned. So that's why you know, the Pandavas knew Jayadrath was there, but they, didn't, they hadn't considered him a formidable threat. But Jayadrath had a secret wound from Lord Shiva. And for one day, he would be able to stop the Pandavas except Arjuna. And he used that wound and Abhimanyu was trapped inside. Abhimanyu fought heroically and the Pandavas fought desperately from outside. But sometimes you know, sincerity is no substitute for competence. Like somebody is sick and we want to help them. But if we don't have medical training, no matter how sincere our intention is, so sincerity, it's not equivalent to competence. They just didn't have that competence. And they were trapped outside. The Abhiman knew was heroic, but the odds were too heavy against him. And still he fought on. But finally, six warriors attacked him simultaneously, shattered his armor, destroyed his weapons, and finally Durjaya, the son of Dushyasan, hit the last blow. And Abhimanyu was killed. Now, when Abhimanyu was killed, the Kauravas celebrate. <coughs> and the Pandavas were devastated. And among the Pandavas, the most guilt stricken was who? Yudhishthira. Yudhishthira was a Kshatriya, was a warrior. But he was very much like a Brahminical Kshatriya. So, first of all, he was not, if you it's a Yudhishthira was more like a Brahmana Kshatriya and Bhima was like a Kshatriya Kshatriya. He was a Kshatriya squared. <laughs> <laughs> so, Yudhishthira's approach was always to try to find a peaceful solution as much as possible. You know, like, bend backward, accommodate the other person as much as you can. Bhishma, Bhima, on the other hand, seemed to be itching for a fight <laughs> most of the time. Right. But here, Yudhishthira, after all, was the king, and Yudhishthira had spoken to Abhimanyu. And for him, the guilt was immense. He said that. Now, I send my son in an extended family. They're, they're, they're like, you know, your brother's son, your sister's son, is still like almost like your own son. There's a sense of belonging over there. So Abhiman says, I send that 16 year old boy to his death. And for what? Just so that I could protect my life. The chakra view was for ultimately for arresting Yudhishthira. And they knew their target. So 
they knew that that was not like a uh, top secret that Drona had made this vow and Duryodhan was seeking to help Yudhishthira rest. They knew that. Now, of course, Yudhishthira had not, not been concerned about his own protection alone. His concern had actually been to protect the entire army. Because if the Chakravyu advanced, had advanced, his army would not have given in without a fight. And he would have eventually been arrested. But before that, his army would have been largely devastated. So it was not just for his own life. But that is the nature of a humble or a gentle soul. The one actually takes responsibility, sometimes more than what is <coughs> So he was burdened by guilt. And he was felt so burdened by guilt, he said that, how will I be able to face Arjuna when he comes back? He says, he says, I will fight against the Kauravas and I will avenge Abhimanyu's death. Or I will lay down my life. I can't face Yudhishthira Arjuna. And Yudhishthira started charging towards the Kaurava. As he was charging, suddenly Vyasadeva appeared over there. And Vyasadeva told Yudhishthira, Yudhishthira, although he was very disturbed. Still, he was cultured. So he immediately got off his chariot and offered respects to Vyasthi. And he spoke, poured out his heart. He says, the son of Arjuna has been killed and I am devastated by it. So, Vyasthi told Vithishthir, O king, do not act impulsively. There is a higher plan working over here. He says the, the will of the Lord is inscrutable, yet it is infallible. Two things he says, the divine will, that is God's will, he says it is inscrutable. <coughs> what does inscrutable mean? Question. Yeah, we can't scrutinize it. We, it will not be understandable for us. I was given this class once and somebody said, the word inscrutable is inscrutable for us. <laughs> <laughs> so, inscrutable it is, in, in say, inconceivable, incomprehensible. Not always, but many times. But at the same time, it is infallible. Infallible means that the Lord does not fail us. That He does not make mistakes. His will is ultimately, it is benevolent. It is for the good of everyone. And He says, first He says, the Lord's will is inscrutable. But it is meant for the welfare of everyone. If you do His will, you will realize this in your course. So what this means is, see, if this is the path and we are here right now and while we are here, we feel like a huge block has come upon us. Sometimes the block may be in front of us stopping us, sometimes the block may simply be on top of us crushing us. So when that has come, at that time we feel, why is, why is this happening? Why is God doing this? So he says, exactly finding out that, that can be inscrutable. But, says, if you keep doing his will, then you will understand it in your course. So why God does what he does, that is often not known for us. So he says, O king, this war is nearing an end now. Do not lose heart. Stay steady. Somewhat pacified by Vyasthev's words, Yudhishthira went back. Now, here, if we analyze Yudhishthira's plan to send Abhimanyu away, was it a good plan or a bad plan? What do you think? Let's look at it. I don't want an opinion. 
Let's do an analysis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I mean it's a, it's we can, I said the three factors why we should analyze. What are the factors? So if you look at your digital plan. Now in terms of intent, was it good? Yes. 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 Yeah. Is it good? In terms of content? Yes. 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 Well, yes. Partially yes. <laughs> 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 good <point> question. Mark. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and in terms of consequence? No. 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 So his intent was to he was a king, he was to protect his army. In terms of content, he could say, based on the information that he had at that time, it was a sound plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Say if the next day he had to do the same thing again. And if he had additional information, would he have done that? No. no. So we could say the content of the plan was uh, when in the circumstances it was good. It was okay. But it was actually not. So sometimes it's not so easy to put categorization. Now he, in one sense, was taking the burden that I wanted to protect myself, and that's why I did it. So that intent was. Sometimes what happens is, uh, humility is good, but humility should not come at the cost of honesty. Sometimes in being humble, we take blame for what we have not done also. Now of course, sometimes ego can also be at the cost of honesty. That means, even when we have done something wrong, we don't accept the blame for it. <laughs> so Duryodhan was like that. Now, Duryodhan... He was, so many sages came before the Kurukshetra war and told him that don't fight this war. And he said, and he was just not ready to listen. He said, and then finally, the sages said that so many of us have advised you, why are you not listening to us? And his response was that after all, the Creator has given everyone their nature. I am simply acting according to my nature and fighting. <laughs> So, why are you blaming me? If anyone you want to blame, you should blame the Creator. <laughs> so, this is where a person is not ready to take responsibility also. Even when the responsibility is there. In this case, the intent itself was bad. Whatever the content of his plans. Now, at this stage, there was gloom in the Pandava environment. And Arjuna came back. And when Arjuna came to know when you had been killed, he was shattered. So Mahabharata, the entire chapter describing Arjuna's agony. And then his agony gave rise to anger. And generally when we are angry, we just lash out at whoever we can. Whoever is nearby. So Arjuna lashed out at the Pandavas, especially at the Jesus. Are all of your weapons just mere ornaments? Could not one of you protect my son? Shame on you and your prowess. And he spoke this. Especially Yudhishthir and Bhima. Especially Yudhishthir. They felt as if they were lashed by whips. His words were like that. That painful for them. At that time Krishna came over to Arjuna and pulled him in a side hug. So Partha in this world Bad things happen to everyone. Adversities befall everyone. The wise people and the unwise people. What differentiates the two? Whether we are wise or whether we are unwise. Adversities will befall everyone. He says what differentiates the two is amid adversities the unwise, they act in ways that make things worse. Whereas the wise, they act in ways that make things better. So he says, oh Arjuna, look at the faces of your brothers. They are in agony at the death of Abhimanyu, just as you are. Please don't speak words that will increase their agony. And hearing this, 
calm energy now. And then he, what was the cause of Atman Yu's death? See, generally when an event happens, there could be multiple causes to the same event. So if any event is there, now, suppose somebody says that, say right now, say I am getting a little cough. Now, this particular event, I could say I am getting a cough because I went out in the cold just now for a walk. Or, I could say it's because, you know, I have uh, a bad lungs. Or, I could say it's because I am not used to the weather of Australia. Or, I could say, this body is Vyadhi Mandir. This body is just a place of diseases. <coughs> Or I could go further and say that, okay, this world itself is Dukkhale. <laughs> now, the same action can be attributed to various causes. And to some extent, there is truth to all of them. If right now one of you is feeling cold, <coughs> now you could say, why am I feeling cold? Oh, because I'm sitting near the window. Oh, you know, because, because I'm not wearing warm clothes. Oh, because, uh, because I have a body that is vulnerable to so, The same action you could place in multiple causal frameworks. So generally speaking, intelligence. So why am I talking about this? We are moving toward the concluding part of the class now. That generally speaking, whenever any event happens, the unhealthy intelligence. See, intelligence can also be sound and unsound. <coughs> the unsound intelligence points to the most disempowering cause of the problem. The most, now what do I mean by disempowering cause? The cause about which we can do nothing. And yes, any analysis you can do. So for example, if some guest comes to our house and they say, you know, I'm feeling cold. What to do Prabhu? This world is dukkha <laughs> <laughs> Now, <laughs> No, that would be irresponsible. <laughs> Yeah, this world is Dukkhale. <laughs> but you know, your house doesn't have to be Dukkhale. Is it? You know? That is, this Dukkha can be addressed. You know, maybe increase the temperature, use some warm clothes, do something practical. So, when there is a solution available, if you don't think about that solution, and we go towards the most disempowering or paralyzing cause, then what happens is, that just makes things worse. On the other hand, Sound intelligence goes towards the most empowering cause. What do you mean empowering cause over here? That means the cause about which we can do something. So, in every situation, okay, if I am feeling cold right now, let's, let's get some warm clothes. After all, think about, is my body too not sensitive to this temperature? Whatever, then we can think about after this. So, in general, if you want to understand people, you know, whenever they face problems, how do they explain problems? Or how do they see the cause of the problems? Like something goes wrong, and you know, maybe one person is cheated by another person. And they say, oh, this person is terrible. Or people are terrible. Mm -hmm. Or they would say that. You know, I was in America and I saw that one car, bump, car bumper, it had a coat. So the more I get to know people, the more I love my dog. <laughs> <laughs> so, people are so terrible and untrustworthy, I don't care about people. <laughs> well, okay, that is too generalizing. See, so, if suppose we are cheated, we could say, oh, this person is terrible. People in general are terrible. Or I could say, I am a terrible judge of people. And then, now each of these explanations will lead to different courses of action for us. And the unhealthy mind, the unsound intelligence, 
goes towards the most disempowering explanation. Oh, you know, fate is against me. Like, very kismati put here. Some people say like that. So now, that is not at all helpful. There could be many causes. And yes, you could say, this is, maybe this happened because of my destiny. But if I can't change my destiny, if this issue has to be addressed, I have to think about something which I can do. So if you see, Abhimanyu's death could have been attributed to many different causes. It could be attributed to Yudhishthira's plan. It could have been attributed to Drona's decision of making that chakra view. It could have been attributed to Duryodhana's obstinacy because of which the war was fought. It could have been attributed to Durjaya who actually hit the killing blow. But here, Duryodhana, Arjuna focused on the, you could say the most actionable cause. He says, he, when he heard about it, yeah. He said the Pandava's plan was sound. And Jayadra's intervention was not just opportunistic, it was meanly opportunistic. Okay, Jayadra, he had enmity against the Pandavas. He could have fought the Pandavas. But he fought the Pandavas at a time by which Abhimanyu was killed. Got strapped and then killed. So then Arjuna said that I am going to bring Abhimanyu Jayadra down by the next day sunset. Then there was a great fight over there. Now, here, it was actually a very difficult task to do. And the Kauravas arranged their entire army to try to protect Jayadrat. So how it was? There was an entire Kaurava army which just spread, spread far and wide. And Jayadrat was right behind it. And Arjuna was over here. So actually the Mahabharata described this was the several miles distance. So much was the army. And throughout it was protected by powerful generals. Now in this case when he made this plan, you could this might also seem to be like a foolhardy plan. He says that if I don't kill him then I will die. Now when this plan came about, when Arjuna took this vow, the Pandavas celebrated. If Arjuna has taken a vow, he will fulfill it. But on the other side, when Duryodhana heard it, he also celebrated. <laughs> he said, this is our opportunity. He said that there is no way, I, maybe Karana could have killed Arjuna, Arjuna but he's not sure. It's if he, but if he just stop it, he said, we will be able to win this war. So Duryodhana told Drona, now you make the entire army stop Jayadrath. When Jayadrath came to the he came running. And his face was like a white ash, it almost looked like a phantom kind of thing. Mm He's -hmm. so scared, he says, that, that uh, Arjuna has taken a vow to kill me. It's okay, guarantee my protection, otherwise I'm fleeing to the Himalayas right now. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, Duryodhana said, don't worry, we will protect. We will surely protect you. What will Drona? Drona said, yes, I will arrange my entire army to protect you. But Drona in his mind was thinking that, ye to gaya. Thinking that, Arjuna alone would find it very difficult to penetrate the entire army. But, Arjuna was not alone. Arjuna was with Yes. With Krishna, he said, even the entire army of the Devutas and Dhanavas combined would not be able to stop Arjuna and Krishna. So what to speak of it? He says, we will do our best to protect him. He said, and even if you are not able to protect him, <laughs> Jayadra said, trembling, he said, there is no disgrace for a warrior to die on a battlefield. <laughs> no, 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 that will never happen to Jayadra. <laughs> But the next day, Arjuna and Krishna fought. And we know the whole story, how they kept fighting, kept fighting. And Arjuna was strategically guided by Krishna on many occasions. <coughs> Initially, Drona challenged him. And Arjuna was fighting fiercely with Drona. And then as the fight was going on, Krishna told Arjuna, this fight with Drona can go on all, all day. You don't have time for it today. So Arjuna just shot a series of arrows and stunned Drona. And Krishna just took his chariot by his side. 
by the time Drona recovered, he said, Arjuna, where are you going? I want to fight with you. <laughs> so, Arjuna just went on. Either Krishna guided at his strategic points. And the finally, what happened was, Arjuna came very close to Jayadratha. On that day also something similar happened in Yudhishthira. Yudhishthira thought yesterday, I had said Abhimanyu inside. And Abhimanyu was trapped. Today, Arjuna has gone inside. What if he is trapped? So then he first sent Satyaki inside. And then he said, Satyaki, Satyaki went inside. Satyaki was Arjuna's student. He was Drona's student also, but he was Arjuna's student also. So, he said, Satyaki went inside, then Arjuna, we must. Then, uh, Yudhishthira started thinking that, Satyak is also young. What if he gets trapped before he reaches Arjuna also? Mm. So then he looked around. And Bhima was itching for some action. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, if like a, like a cricket match is going on and a football match is going on. And some top player is on the sidelines, you know, sitting on the benches. Mm. Looking at the coach, where are you going to send me inside? <laughs> <laughs> so Bhima was like that. He said, can, can you follow? He said, yes! And Bhima just charged through the trail of destruction that Arjuna had born as Arjuna and Mahashri. So, with the help, for Arjuna to reach was very, very difficult. But with Satyaki and Bhima's help, Arjuna came very close. Then Karna came to challenge Arjuna. At that time, Bhima sidetracked Karna. And Bhima and Karna fought fiercely. And then Arjuna came very close to Jayatrat. And Duryodhana was devastated. Just looking at Arjuna, charging through, breaking his entire army formation. He said, what's happening? What's happening? He was thinking. And he said, it seems that not only will I lose Jaydara, I will lose the entire war today itself. And he was thinking, dejected like that. Suddenly he saw that the sun was very close to the horizon. He said, maybe all is not closed. See, for him his reasoning was, so actually when Arjuna was just charging through the Panda, Kaurav forces, he said, you know, maybe Krishna is really God. <laughs> <laughs> he never really accepted, even when Krishna had shown the universal form, he just thought Krishna had shown the magic. And he caught us by surprise. <laughs> and he said, maybe Krishna is God. But then he started thinking, if Krishna is God, then Arjuna is Krishna, very dear to Krishna. Krishna would not want Arjuna to be hurt. And yet Arjuna's son Abhimanyu was killed. Abhimanyu was killed, therefore Krishna is not God. <laughs> so the, the world is such that if you want to be an atheist, you will find reasons to be an atheist. You will find evidence to be an atheist. You know, if you see the way the world is arranged, the way, you know, all the water is concentrated in the oceans. How do we get rains? It's a sophisticated arrangement by which the clouds are formed. The clouds are like mobile, airborne, aircraft proof water tanks. In the twin tower designers could not make aircraft proof technology. Aircraft proof technology. It's amazing if you look at how much organization is there in nature. It's easy to look, to consider that there's a divine intelligence behind it. But sometimes atheists will ask, if rains are arranged by God, to provide, provide humanity with water. Then why does it rain on the oceans? Well, it rains on the oceans so that atheists can ask this question. <laughs> 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 and choose to be atheistic. So if you want, you can have that evidence. So he said, yes. He said, yesterday, I had six warriors attack Arjuna. Attack him and you can stop him. Said, Today, we will have, this is Abhimanyu's father, so we'll have eight warriors attack him simultaneously. So he told them, he says, Drona and Kripa, you attack him from the front. He says, Kritavarman and Jan, you, you attack him from the left. And he says, Karana and Ashwatthama, you attack him from the right. He says, Dushyasana and I will attack him from behind. And all eight attack Arjuna simultaneously. And Arjuna was just whirling around, just stopping the countering and blocking the a sea of arrows that was rushing towards him. Arjuna could see the standard, the chariot flag of Jayadrath, but he just could not even move forward, he could barely maintain himself. And the sun was rushing toward the horizon. So close. 
I eat so far. Arjuna started despairing. It was that time that Krishna chose to intervene. Now Krishna summoned this chakra, Sudarshan chakra, and sent it towards the sun. And suddenly, the darkness spread across the battlefield. And the cover of warriors started celebrating. Yes, Arjuna is dead. And Jayadath had been hiding behind like a power to them. Jayadath came forward and said, Should I light your funeral pyre now, Arjuna? <laughs> and as Arjuna vexed and lowering his bow in disappointment, Krishna told Arjuna, There is time still. Raise your bow and place the Brahmastra on it. And now Arjuna heard Krishna and there is a time to ask questions and there is a time to not ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> so Arjuna put the Brahmastra on his and invoked it. And then Krishna just removed the chakra. And he said, There is the sun. And there is Jayadrath. Shoot! And just in front of the amazed and horrified eyes of the Kauravas, Arjuna's bow discharged an arrow that sailed through the sky, apparently piercing it apart as a blaze of flame went with it. And Jayadrath was aghast, utterly unprepared. And the arrow just pierced his head. As Arjuna was shooting the arrow, Krishna told him, shoot his head in such a way it will go and fall on the lap of his father, who is performing austerities nearby at Sinant Pachak. His father had got a vow that anyone who causes his son head to fall on the ground would himself have his head crack apart. So, what Krishna did was use his bone against him itself. So, the, he was sitting in meditation and suddenly felt something fall on his lap. He would have skull with blood and just it, pushed it down. And as soon as it fell down, his own skull exploded. So, now, as the Kauravas lamented, Krishna and Arjuna celebrated and they blew conscious and then the Dishtra also knew that this was victorious. Now, this was not just one battle won or that Arjuna was successful as well. This was actually devastating for the morale of the Kauravas along with their army. A large part of their army had been destroyed by Bhima and Arjuna, especially Arjuna. But more than that, the optics of it that the entire army could not stop one warrior from penetrating, tearing through the entire army. They couldn't protect one person. How was this army ever going to win against the opposite? <laughs> so it was completely demoralizing, demoralizing for the cover of forces. So the point is that one plan didn't succeed. The second plan succeeded. Now was it the second plan was better? Well, Arjuna also took that plan. He says, hey, a little bit of impulse. Later on, Krishna said to Arjuna, that night, 13th night, he said, Krishna, without, he said, without consulting me, O Partha, you have taken a very hasty vow. He said that. And Arjuna said to Krishna, Krishna, I do not understand your worry. He said, you know my power. And I know your power. <laughs> <laughs> so what is there to worry? <clears throat> so now the literature associated with Mahabharata, there are many like uh, Loka Pramana Kathas. So one of the stories that said that that night, Arjuna slept soundly. But Krishna couldn't sleep. Krishna was pacing up and down in the tent. And sometimes when we are anxious, for someone else, and that person is sleeping peaceful. <laughs> we feel annoyed with that person. How oh, are you sleeping so peacefully? <laughs> so there's a South Indian poet. He says that you know, 
such are my devotees. They go to sleep and make me sleepless. <laughs> Leave me sleepless. But the point is that, was one plan better than another plan works? Well, we don't know. At that time, we don't know. Some plans work, some plans don't work. What we do is, we try to keep our intent pure, we use our intelligence, and do the best. Shri Prabhupada tried his best in India to share Krishna Bhakti. And he was very earnest, he tried almost a dozen things. He tried to run a magazine, then he wrote a book, he wrote, he wrote Easy Journey to Other Planets, then he tried to start an organization, he tried this, tried that, tried that, but nothing seemed to be working. And then finally, in one sense, Prabhupada's going to America was as devilish a plan as Arjuna saying that I will kill Jayadrath in one day. Because Prabhupada was nearly the, the end of his life. He was almost 70 by that time. And he went to America. Many people told him so that they said in their minds, almost everyone, some people said, well, you are not successful in India when people follow this culture. How will you be successful in America? Who will listen to you? But Prabhupada was wholehearted in his determination. And even in America, it was not that every single service worked out. Prabhupada tried many things. Some things worked, some things didn't work. So what worked, Prabhupada continued with that. What didn't work, Prabhupada recalibrated. <coughs> Prabhupada was always fixed in his purpose. Whatever happens, I am going to serve Krishna. The Pandavas were always fixed in their purpose. They didn't want a kingdom for themselves. They wanted it for Krishna. But they were flexible with respect to their plans. But the key to maintaining our enthusiasm is to have this balance to be fixed in our purpose. That whatever service I am doing, whatever responsibility I have, whatever aspiration I have, ultimately it is to serve Krishna. So stay fixed in that purpose. But this specific plan, okay, if this works out, but if this doesn't work out, this, this doesn't work out, this, we be flexible. And in due course of time, Krishna will reveal which plan will work and which plan won't work. So our surrender to Krishna is in accepting that when our plan is not working, we don't think that, oh, God doesn't care, God doesn't exist. That we say, that, yeah, Krishna must be having a better plan for me. I conclude with our last point. Sometimes we are praying to Krishna and the prayer doesn't seem to be answered. Whatever we are doing, it just seems, the problem seems to be there, or it seems to be worsening. Then, what do we do at such times? How do we maintain the faith? So two things. First is that no prayer ever goes unanswered. Because even a no is an answer. And when apparently no is coming as an answer, what it means is that Krishna has a bigger and better yes in the future for us. So, as devotees, if our purpose is to serve Krishna, why do we serve Krishna? Because he is all benevolent. He is Surudam Sarva Bhutana. So what happens is, say, if, if this is Krishna above all of us, and we are here, we are trying to pray, and apparently we get no as an answer. So we don't fixate on the answer. We focus on the person. That, oh, why is this no? Well, if it is no, Krishna must be having something better for me. So if we focus, if we, if we fixate on the answer, we'll become discouraged. Oh, Krishna doesn't care for me. Focus on the person, well, Krishna has some plan, Krishna has some purpose. And, in fact, the second thing we could do at such times is, look back at our past. We have often, we have often sought Krishna's help, we may have prayed. And even in the past, sometimes our prayers have been unanswered. If we look back at our past with honesty, we'll find that whenever our prayers were unanswered, actually something better came up later. And this is actually, there's wisdom and there is humble wisdom. So in general, a person who is wise is grateful. You know, there are many things which I have to write in my life, I should be grateful. 
that humble wisdom is grateful even for unanswered prayers. You know, if you, if you look at our past, you know, maybe Krishna didn't answer my prayer at that time. That's why I didn't go down that door and then some other door opened for me. Something better came up. If we can look back at our past and we'll find one incident like that where a prayer not being answered took us to a better place eventually. Then we can maintain our faith even in our present situation where a prayer is not being answered. But Krishna does have a better plan for us. So that way we can be fixed in our purpose to serve Krishna. Krishna is not going to abandon us. Krishna is not going to reject us. It is not that Krishna doesn't care for us. Just because he doesn't seem to be caring for our plan. And by that we can be flexible. Or we can be open. We can hold our plan, particular plan, lightly. I'll summarize what I discussed today. I started by talking about this balance between purpose and plan. So we hold the purpose lightly and we hold the plan lightly. If we hold the plan tightly, then we'll become resentful. We lose enthusiasm when things don't work. And if we hold the purpose lightly, then we will never be enthusiastic at all. We'll just be diffused. And then at that connection, we discussed, okay, how do we know whether a plan is right or wrong? That's based on three factors. What are the factors? Consequence. And then? So, we discussed various examples. Especially for the Mahabharata. We discussed day 13 and 14. Yudhishthira's plan in terms of intent was fine. Content was also okay. Consequences turned out to be terrible. In terms of uh, Arjuna's plan, in terms of intent also it was good. In terms of content, we could say again, we could say it was a fee, but that it is quite a foolhardy plan at one level. In terms of consequence, it worked out. So, how do we know which plan is going to work out, which don't? we don't? But we have to do our best. So, one of the key points we discussed is that intelligence amid problems. What we do is, we look for the most empowering cause. Mm. So, Krishna told Arjuna that adversities come upon both the wise and the unwise. The unwise act in ways that make things worse. So, if we may be in a problem where we just, nothing seems to be working. Well, we say, I'm helpless. Well, not necessarily. We all know that we could do certain things which will make things worse. So at least avoid doing that. And then try to find out what is the most. So Arjuna didn't blame Yudhishthira, Arjuna didn't blame Drona, focus on Jayatrath. And that led him forward. And the last part with this we talk about is that to be grateful amid unanswered prayers. You can do that by seeing that not just the not, not just that there is no answer, but rather, no is also an answer. And that, don't focus on the answer, focus on the person. The person has is benevolent. And how can we have that faith that person benevolent? You can look at the past. And even when unanswered prayers open a better door for us. And that way, we can maintain our enthusiasm even amidst life's discouraging situations. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So is there any enthusiasm remaining for any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Suppose I do have one for related to point number three. We discussed that the negative people think on a most deteriorating post rather than most empowering post. But in some cases, we, we don't know whether this, uh, whatever action we are doing, it might be most deteriorating or most empowering post. We don't know that part. So, in that case, how can we differentiate what is right and what is wrong? Okay, if we may may not know which is the most disempowering cause. Well, in general, absolutalizing or universalizing any problem, that is unhealthy. Generally, small problems deal with them at a small level. Then if they don't tell the small level, go at a bigger level, bigger level, bigger level. So for example, if you consider depression, 
Now, what causes depression? We could say many things. Now, everybody faces failures in life. But not everybody who faces setbacks and failures becomes depressed. So what happens is, it's not just the depression. It's the interpretation. It's, a, it's not just the failure. There is failure as an event. And then there is the meaning that we assign to the event. So what is the meaning that we assign? So here, if I am a loser, if that is the meaning somebody assigns, then that is an extremely broad, uh, that is too absolute a meaning. Generally, whenever somebody fails, you could say, I have lost. That's one meaning. Okay. Yeah, I tried to do this and do a call. Other meaning could be, I am lost. I don't know what to do, things are not working out for me. But the most damaging meaning is, I am a loser. So we are taking this too personally, too absolutely. So if, if, if I am a loser, then what is the point even of living? Isn't it? So, sometimes when we are faced with a problem, start with the small. In general, the Vedas say that, start with the dushta cause, then go to the adushta cause. Whenever there is a problem, start with the visible, immediate solution. And if that doesn't work, then you can go further, 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 further. No. <clears throat> if, if somebody eats a dozen ice creams on a cold night, and the next morning they have a terrible throat. And now what is it? Why did you get this throat? Oh, it's my past karma. <laughs> well, okay, it's past karma, but it is past night's karma, not past life's karma. <laughs> so, uh, generally, go to the cause that is addressable. So, you may say, I don't know. Well, you can, we can know which cause will just make us resentful. No, this will just make us powerless. Let's say, okay, which is the cause I can do something about? And then focus on that. So, that will be the which is the empowering cause, the cause that we can do something about. This empowering cause is the cause we can do nothing about. Now sometimes we can also go toward that cause. But then that is the mode of acceptance and then we focus our energy somewhere else. But where we just become paralyzed, then that is not of much. Okay? Thank you. Any other questions? So... When Abhimanyu was killed and Arjun became angry and he lamented. But just before that, Krishna explained the whole Bhagavad Gita. Then still he came back to the same position. Like he started lamenting, he got angry. Why so? Yeah, I would have been lamenting if nobody had asked this question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. See, there is philosophy and there is our humanity. So, philosophy is not meant to deny our humanity. Is it just because, you know, the philosophy that the soul is eternal? Does that mean if a parent loses a child, they will not, they will not feel bad, they will not feel sad? Yeah, I and mean, the soul is eternal, that's okay. But I have lost my relationship right now. So, basically, when we talk about our spirituality, What does our spirituality do? Our spiritual, this is our humanity and our spirituality reveals to us a reality above our humanity. So that there is more to me than my humanity. But this is the more complete understanding. But sometimes what we do is we use our spirituality to almost like extinguish our humanity. That the spirituality is only there and everything human, that is just Maya. But it's not that simple. Our humanity is also a reality. And we need to deal with each as human beings. So when there is loss, there will be grief. And we need to support each other. And that's why 
if you say okay my dad jinan but guys as uh, devotees we may we may ask questions about another devotee but they might not ask ask the same question about krishna no why did krishna tell arjuna hey arjuna you forgot that i just told you the bhagavad gita <laughs> how dumb can you be or are you going to say that krishna forgot that he had spoken the bhagavad gita no in one sense krishna is himself demonstrating what he taught in the bhagavad gita how is that ultimately be applied because ultimately the application is not that we become heartless to become spiritual does not mean that we be heartless the uh, it 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 just means that we understand as a bigger purpose than what we can see to reality so if there is grief if somebody has lost something severely and they're grieving at that time we should not be thinking oh this was just attached and sentimental and ignorant no we should be thinking okay this person is distressed how can i help this person in situation and wisdom giving philosophical wisdom can be one resource but it shouldn't be the sole resource that we have when we are helping people philosophy can help them at times but we shouldn't reduce people's distress to an opportunity to preach philosophy to them if that happens then we will come off as very heartless like some people as soon as they get a hammer and they find no okay the hammer and push up nail into the wall they become so excited that the whole world becomes reduced to nails <laughs> so sometimes we get the philosophy and we go so excited with the philosophy that we think this hammering the philosophy down to others is the solution to all problems krishna himself is demonstrating it not like that at that point we have to be sensitive what is this person going through and how can i be of service to this person and by being of service if philosophy is one resource that is helpful i can use it but so there is being being there to support to encourage to solace that's what is required at that time okay the last question is to so thank you very much shila prabhupada ki jai gaur bhakta vrind ki jai hitai gaur premanande jai